I'm excited to minister this word. I'm going to continue where I was at last week. I mean, I'm going to speak and minister around the topic of winning people for Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, the Apostle Paul, we looked at this last week. He says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. He said, I have become all things to all people that I might by all means necessary save some. The Apostle Paul had one goal, and that was to win people to Jesus. And I want to talk about winning the more. I want to talk about how we can how we can be evangelists in our city, how we can be evangelists in our neighborhood, how we can win people for the Lord. Amen, church. I ended last week with uh, the ninth chapter of Matthew where Jesus said, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. And I ended with the story of D.L. Moody. And I ended with, uh, the man that led D.L. Moody to the Lord was his Sunday school teacher. And one of my points last week was that, that we seize opportunities, we open our mouth and speak about Jesus, but we, we leave it all up to God. He's the only one who can save. We put him in God's hands. And in the story last week, the Sunday school teacher had such a burden for, for D.L. Moody. And he wanted to see this young man give his life to Jesus. And so he went to his job and he, he spoke to him about the Lord and he thought he did a terrible job. He thought he, he, you know, botched it. A lot of times that's how we feel. We're like, I sounded stupid. I didn't know what I was saying. I sounded so dumb. And he left discouraged. Little did he know that D.L. Moody responded to the invitation that he gave to, to, to receive Jesus that day. And D.L. Moody, of course, went on to be one of the greatest evangelists uh, and, and preachers and minist- uh, hundreds of thousands of people impacted by his ministry. Millions of people, that souls, they say were saved because of his ministry. And so I want to now pick up where I left off last week, and I want to look at it from the perspective from D.L. Moody. He tells the story because the Sunday school teacher thought he did a terrible job. And D.L. Moody now talks about the Sunday school t- teacher having enough boldness and faith and courage to come to his job and he said I remember the day that my Sunday school teacher showed up to my job I was at the the machine shop working and he said he showed up to the shop and he he began to talk to me about Christ and he put his hand on my shoulder and he talked to me about my soul and he said I had not felt that I had a soul till then I, sell, I said to myself, this is a very strange thing. Here is a man who does not really know me, and he's weeping over my sins. And he said, I've never even shed a tear about them. But I understand it now and know what it is to have a passion for men's souls and weep over their sins. He says, I don't remember what he said, but I can still feel the power of that man's hand on my shoulder that night. Again, it wasn't about what the man said. It was about that he shared Jesus with him. And he, made, he, res, he responded to the invitation that he gave. And he remembered. And he went on, of course, to, again, do great things for God. And I love the story one time where he was walking down the street of Chicago, D.L. Moody, the great D.L. Moody. And he walks up to a man, as he always would, and he asked him, he said, Are you a Christian? And the man raised his fist and angrily responded. He said, you mind your own business. And I love what D.L. Moody said. This is my business. And I just come to say today, if you're a Christian, this is our business. We're, it's not only for some to reach people. It's for all of us. It's not only for a pastor. It's for all of us that we are called to win people for Jesus. If you believe it, say amen this morning. So I want to talk about winning the loss and winning the more, as the Apostle Paul said. And remember what Jesus, he said in Matthew chapter 9, going back there, he said, the harvest is plentiful. That means there's so many people to reach. We could testify. Look at the city that we live in. Just look at our city. There's a city that needs to be reached for Jesus. There's a lot of people that don't know the Lord they're, or they're backslidden. They're not walking with God. 
And Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, people, again, remember what D.L. Moody said, this is my business to reach people. Jesus said, we need more people like D.L. Moody that will make it their business that will labor to reach the lost. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The next line is so important. Therefore, pray. Somebody say pray. Pray Pray the Lord of the harvest. Send out laborers into the harvest. And that's where we're going to land today. We're going to talk about praying for the lost. Jesus gave us this example of how we can see people one for Jesus, how we can see laborers increase. Because he said, if you pray for laborers, the harvest will come. If you flip the page, this is the last few verses of Matthew chapter 9. If you flip the page, you see the answer to the prayer that Jesus prayed. That lets us know that prayer works, that that prayer is a key to this thing. A lot of people want to see results, but we don't want to spend time praying about it. I'm going to tell you right now that, that great things come through prayer. Come on. Great things are birthed in the place of prayer. Souls are one. Come on, we can see soul winners. We can see more D.L. Moody's come because there's some people that know how to pray and, and win the lost. Amen. And you see the next chapter. Here are the 12 that Jesus sends out. The answer to the prayer that he prayed in the last chapter. I'm believing that as we pray, we can win the lost. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 22, I want to give you a moment. Go to Ezekiel chapter 22. It's going to be our our verse we're going to jump off with. It it is the verse that is known as the vain search for a man to stand in the gap. That's what the heading in my Bible says. The vain search for a man to stand in the gap. Ezekiel chapter 22, and if you're having trouble finding it, it's after the book of Lamentations. Just Get, you'll get all mixed up in that area of the Bible. Some of you just struggling, just, just look or go to the concordance and find it. No shame in the game. Or if you got a digital Bible, you should get there quickly. But the 22nd chapter, the 30th verse says, I look for someone, this is God, I look for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness. That righteousness that guards the land. I search for someone, look at this word, to stand in the gap in the wall so I wouldn't have to destroy the land but I found look at this no one kind of reminds me of what Jesus was saying the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few there's not a lot of people that want to stand in the gap not a lot of people that want to stand in the gap and I'm going to just preach on a simple topic this morning fill the gap if we're going to win the lost we have to be willing to fill the gap Look at the person on your right or left. I'm going to have you help me this morning. Look at them and say, hey, it's time to get in the gap. It's time to get in the gap. The gap speaks of (laughs) out of the mouth of babes. Thou hast perfected praise. That's right. Our kids are going to know how to serve God and love God. They ain't going to think, they going to think it's abnormal if you don't go to church and amen the preacher. The gap speaks of an opening. It speaks of a breach. A few years ago, a storm rolled through and knocked our privacy fence over at our house and it only knocked a section of the privacy fence over. So there was still, the portion of our fence was remaining, but we had a section that had been, that had uh, been knocked over. And now there was a gap. And up until that point, we had never had this issue, but after, while the fence was down, our neighbor's dog began to roam into our yard because it was used to the fence being there to keep it out. And so the, the neighbor's dog began to roam in our yard. Well, then one particular day, it came up on our back porch. And it's about that time that our son Silas, he was a little boy at that time, he had been praying for a dog. And he thought that it was an answer. He thought that, that God had answered his prayer. He had been asking for a puppy. And every time, he had asked Santa, he had asked everybody, puppy. And we had never came through for the puppy until 
He thought that moment was his moment. Look, God answers prayer. And it was a cute little puppy, but it belonged to the neighbor. But it kind of reminds me, uh, and I'm not saying this puppy was a was an evil little puppy, but I'm just thinking about how the enemy can disguise itself and disguise himself as cute and innocent. And if we allow access, that fence is down. Now he can just come on in. It's, there's no guard to protect, to keep the enemy from coming in and, and coming in and looking sweet and innocent. You don't realize that he's coming in with bad intentions. Some of you don't even realize that the enemy can make himself look cute. He don't look evil. He looks cute. He puts lipstick on. He puts high heels on. He looks innocent. And if the fence is down, the, 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 the gap is there. There's no one to stand in the gap. There's no one that, that says, no, you can't come in. There's no one that says, nah, you're not allowed through here. I'm going to stand in the gap. I'm going to be one who will guard this place and guard this territory. The prophet prophesied, and thus saith the Lord, and he said, I look for someone to rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I search for someone to stand in the gap. Although this verse is dealing with the sins of Jerusalem, I believe we have permission today to, to, to allow this verse to, to, to shape this message and use it to understand what this means when there's a gap in the wall, there's a breach in the wall, it's a compromised space. It's a place that's compromised. It's, it, it, it allows, again, for, for things that are, are not wanted to come in. And he said, I'm looking for someone to stand in the gap. And at that time, there were false prophets that, that, that would not stand in the gap. They did not have a heart for the people. They did not care about the outbreak of wickedness in the, in the land at that time. They did not care about that people were perishing. They did not care that things were happening. They did not have a heart that was for God and God was looking for somebody that he could use. He was looking for somebody that would step up and he was looking for someone that would say, here I am God. I'll, I'll step up. I'll, I'll fill the gap in the wall. Filling the gap means that, that you're, you're it's, it's interceding. It's an intercession. It's that's what intercession means. It's, it's to come between, to step in. And at that time, there was no one. He said, I found no one. But fortunately for us, God did find a man to stand in the gap. God found a man that would stand in the gap. It was not in Ezekiel's day. It was, it was a, a little bit later on a hill called Calvary. That there was a man that got in the middle between two thieves. He was in the gap in the middle between the two. And he said, I'm going to fill the gap. I'm going to bridge the void. I'm going to stand and no one can fill this gap. Jesus is the man that's in the gap. We know that this could not be done by human effort because if it could have been, we know that, that Jeremiah was a prophet at that time. We know that Ezekiel was a man of God. But there needed to be someone else who could actually fill the void. And there's only one who can fill the void in a life, and his name is Jesus. He is the only one who saves. Jesus saves, and he fills the gap. Remember, to fill the gap means to intercede. Hebrews chapter 7, we know this is... Jesus, because it says, therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost. I like the old timers used to say it, he can save from the guttermost to the uttermost. Maybe you in the gutter this morning, good news for you. Jesus can save you out of the hell that you're in. He can save you out of the place that you're at. He can save from the guttermost to the uttermost. Those who come to God through him since he always lives. This is what, look what he does. He always lives to make intercession for them. That means that's what he does. I stand in the gap. I fill the gap. I fill the space. I'm interceding. Even at this moment, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, that at this very moment, Jesus is interceding for us. 834, he's in, making intercession for us. He's at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf. I love the 26th verse says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. 
For we do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings, which words can, that cannot be uttered. Basically, the, when we don't know what to pray, let the Holy Spirit pray through you because he knows how to pray. He says, oh, you ran out of words to say I haven't. Let me pray through you. Making intercession for us. This is what Jesus does. He fills the gap for us. So since he fills the gap, we're called to do the same. Again, we can't save people people but you know what we can do we can pray for people let me say it one more time we don't do the saving but we do the praying and if we'll be willing to pray for people and that's what it means to intercede for someone to stand in the gap that's an that's an old saying but this is what it means to pray to God on the behalf of others when you stand in the gap for somebody, what you're doing is I'm praying to God for them. I'm interceding for them. I, I'm, I'm doing I'm doing this for them. They don't know how to pray or, or they're not looking to Jesus. They're they're lost in the world. They're lost in their sin. But I'm going to stand in the gap for them. I'm going to pray for them as Jesus has interceded for us so that we can have salvation. I'm going to go ahead and pray and intercede for those that need the Lord. Somebody say amen. Praying for others. Filling the gap. 1 Timothy 2 says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. So this is what we, we're called to do. We're called to pray for people. And I like he says all people. We like to change that word from all to some. Pray for some people. You know, the people you like people. The people you get along with. The people you don't like, you like to curse them. Help their car not to start this morning, God. Help their boyfriend to break up with them. Help them, to, Lord, bust pipes in their house, God. Flood their house. We be praying all kind of wicked, nasty, evil prayers. But we're not called to do this. As Christians, we're called to pray for all people. Ask God, look at this, to help them. Oh, here's this word, fill the gap. Intercede on their behalf. And give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that you can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is not something you see in our world right now. We don't want to pray for authority. We like to reject authority. And we do it in the name of saying, oh, because I got a, I got a right to do it. Yeah, we have a, you got a right to do a lot of things. But you know what we're called to do as Christians so we can live peaceful lives? We're called to pray for even people we disagree with. I don't have to agree with you to pray for you. This, this is the thing. We're not a political church. We're a kingdom church. We don't got no time for all that crazy, stupid stuff. We, what we believe in is we believe in honoring authority and praying for people and praying for leaders. And this is what I say. I say, God, I pray for them even though I disagree with them. I pray for them. And I know that, God, you're able to raise people up and you're able to bring people down. So, therefore, God, I put them in your hands and I pray for them. I don't speak evil about people. We got to understand this is what causes us to, to live Godly, godly lives and lives of dignity. And the third verse says, this is good and pleases God, our Savior. I want to please God. I want to please God. And he says, this is good. When you pray for people, when you get good at praying for folks, you begin to realize you honor God better. You're like, I, don't, I can't honor God. I'm struggling. Well, begin to pray for people. You're like, well, I pray for myself all the time. Well, that's good, but you need to begin to pray for other people as well. A lot of times we have everything we have need of, but we don't think about anybody else around us. Pray for others. This pleases God. Look at this. Why are we to pray for others? Fourth verse. Because he wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. Here it is, a heart to win people. You might have, you might have gave up on them, but God hasn't. You maybe have said, God can't reach them, but God never said that. You might, have, you might say they're really sinful and wicked, but Jesus says, I came and died on the cross for their sin. There's not a sin that cannot be forgiven when it's washed in the blood. Let me just say it again. There's not a sin that cannot be forgiven if it's washed in the blood of Jesus. He is faithful and just to forgive us from all unrighteousness. So therefore, we are called to pray. 
lot of times what we do instead of praying, we're just standing by. We're just observing. And I think it's, it's all right to observe. We should, be, we should be aware of what's happening. But we're so quick to just stand by and do nothing. We're not called to stand by. We're called to stand in. We need, come on, God is looking for some people that will stand in. See, stand by people do nothing. But faith without works is dead faith. Come on, we're not only supposed to be hearers of God's word, but we're supposed to be what? Doers of his word. Stand by people do nothing. A lot of times we end up more complaining about things than doing something. But you know what you can do? You can never change something with complaining, but you sure enough can change it when you pray for them. You can't change somebody that you just, you just criticize and you're negative towards. But you know what you can do is you take them through the throne of grace and you keep praying for them. You keep interceding for them. You keep calling on the name of Jesus for them. And you'll begin to see something happens in their life. Do something. Stand in. Fill the gap. This is our responsibility. D.L. said, it is my business. I believe he's, those words are echoing in 2024 to Victory City Church. It is our business to win the lost. I've seen a story about a captain of a cruise ship back in 2012. Many of you maybe remember in the Mediterranean there was a cruise ship that, that the captain, in a negligent way, went off course. And when he went off course, he struck a reef near the shore. And the ship began to take water on, and there was 4,200 people on this ship. And the captain did something that no captain is supposed to do. He fled the ship and left everybody behind. What a coward way to leave. And, and he left, and he, he left his responsibility. See, the captain left his ship instead of remaining on the ship to make sure everyone could be rescued. This is, this is what people that stand by, you're, you're, re, you're resisting and you're neglecting, I should say, your responsibility to reach people. You're like that captain that says, oh, no, I'm not going to do nothing. I'm just going to let the ship go down. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to step in and I'm going to do something. I'm going to make sure, I'm going to try to rescue as many people that, as I can. Why? Because Jesus rescued me. Jesus saved me and it's because somebody prayed for you and interceded for you and went to the Lord for you you're here today because somebody prayed for you somebody called on the name of Jesus for you somebody got on their knees at night and began to intercede for you and begin to weep for you and begin to call on the name of Jesus for you so why would we not turn around and say you know what I was radically rescued so I'm going to go ahead and radically rescue someone else This takes commitment. I know, I know, I know. This type of preaching and this type of message, it takes commitment. To pray and intercede. And I'm going to give five things. I will not be long, I promise. Five things. Five things that we can pray. You know when a preacher says it won't be long, he never is telling the truth. I hate, I never say that. And I don't know why that came out of my mouth because I already know every time I say it. But I, I'm going to try my best. I'm not going to be long-winded today. Five things we can pray. Five things. Salvation, healing, redemption, transformation, and blessing. These are the five things that we're going to pray. We're going to stand in the gap and pray for people, our, our loved ones, our friends, our coworkers, our classmates, our neighbors. We're going to pray for them. The first one, salvation. We're going to pray that the Father will draw them to Jesus. So this is how you do it. You begin to pray. Father God, draw them to you. Draw them to Jesus. If we lift him up, the Bible says, if you lift me up, Jesus said this, if you lift me up, I will draw all people unto me. No one can come to me, Luke 19, unless the Father who sent me draws him. So our Prayer should be this way. Draw them to you, Jesus. I'm going to pray, Father, draw them to Jesus. Let them see Jesus. Let them, let them see him. Begin to just pull on them, God. Begin to just whisper in their ear at night, God. Begin to just Holy Ghost nudge them, God. Begin to just let them just see you, God, because as they see you, they're going to be drawn unto you. Let them respond to your voice, God. Pray that the Father draws them to Jesus. 
This is, we know this is his heart. He wants all, we read it, all to be saved. He is the one who will leave the 99. Come on, to, to, to rescue someone. So we pray, God, when we get in the gap, pray. God, draw them to Jesus. Second thing we're to pray is we'll pray healing over them. So as we stand in the gap, we pray healing on them. There's so many people that are sick, and they're not just sick in their body. They're sick spiritually. There, there's so many wounds and hurts and pain and drama and trauma and things that people have faced and so many baggage and burdens and all of this stuff that people are going through. And I just pray the healing blood of Jesus Christ, the, by his stripes they are healed is what the Bible says. Our God is a God of miracles. 1 Peter 2, 24 says he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. I'm speaking healing over them. Whatever trauma they faced in life or encountered in life, God, I pray and speak healing over them. Whatever wounds that have, have just, they've dealt with all these years, God, I pray that you would heal them. God, areas of their life that they're sick, God, I pray for the healing power of Jesus Christ to heal them today. Psalms 103 says, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. For he, he who forgives all your sins, and I love this, he who heals all your diseases. It might seem impossible for man, but it's not impossible with God. Our God can do the impossible. Our God is still a miracle worker. Our God is still a way maker. Our God still can do it. Our God is the one who can still, come on, heal a life. He can still heal diseases. Come on. He can still heal sicknesses. Our God can do it. I pray healing over them. The third thing we can pray as we're standing in the gap, we can pray and bind the spirit that blinds people's mind. The truth can be right in front of some people, and they still can't see it. Why? Because there's something blocking their view. Think about it. You could look at people and you can say, why would they keep doing that? We see it, but they don't. Like if they just keep, if they would just stop doing that, it's destroying their life. If they just would quit doing it and we can see the thing that's hurting them or killing them, but they can't. Why? Because the Bible says in second Corinthians four, four, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Their, their mind is blinded. There's, they have scales on their eyes. They can't see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. But you know what we can do? We can pray. As believers, I can pray and I can bind that, that spirit that blinds them. I can pray and I bind it. The Bible says in Matthew 16, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be what? Loosed in heaven. It's time some Christians take some authority and stand in the gap and begin to bind. Come on. That spirit that blinds people so they can see let the enemy be exposed in this season let the enemy be exposed let him be seen for who he really is come on he's a thief he's a robber he comes to steal to kill and destroy let the let the scales fall off of their eyes and let them see the image of jesus he's the redeemer remember i said that there, god is getting ready to redeem redemption when, when we bind that spirit that blinds them, they become redeemed. How? Because he redeems them from destruction. Psalms 103 says he's the, he's the redeemer that they were in a, in a destructive place. But when Jesus gets a hold of your life, come on. He don't just save me and leave me in the destructive place. He lifts me up out of the pit. I was in a pit and he saved me. But he didn't leave me in the pit. He raised me up out of the pit. That's what redemption is. It's when he reaches down and lifts you up. I couldn't lift myself up. But love lifted me. The love of Jesus. Come on. The power of Christ. He lifted me up out of the pit, out of the destruction. I was on a suicidal mission. I was destroying my life with sin. But the Redeemer stepped in and redeemed me. So I'm going to pray. Any obstacle, any distraction, I'm praying, I'm binding that thing. 
Or the enemy throws all kind of distractions and obstacles and things and blinders. Nuh uh. Them things got to come down in this season. As there's some people that will stand in the gap. I'm going to go ahead and preach my voice out this service. I don't care. Those who will say, I'm going to stand in the gap. I'm going to fill the gap and I'm going to pray and bind that spirit that blinds the people to see the truth. Let them see the image of God, which is Jesus. Hey. Fourth thing we can pray. Transformation. How, how does transformation happen? Keep getting closer to Jesus. Keep knowing Jesus better. That's what I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray because you're like, well, how can they change? With some people, that does seem really impossible. How can they change? I said this last week, but it's so true. We just catch them. He cleans them. He changes them. He does the restoring and the transforming. Transforming. I pray that they know God better. Not know church better. Not that church. Church is important. But they just can't know a seat in a church. They just can't know a, a pastor they shake hands with. They just can't know some people that they go to church with. All them things are great. I, those are important things. But you know what the most important thing is? That your relationship with Jesus doesn't stop when you leave this place. Because if it stops when you leave here, transformation is not going to happen. But if you say, I'm taking with me what I got today, and I'm walking about this place with it, watch what God will do Monday through Sunday. Transform you. And so this is how you pray it, that they know God better. This is how you pray it. You release the spirit of wisdom and revelation over them. It's not knowledge they need. They need wisdom. If you have knowledge without wisdom, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Adam and Eve had knowledge. Knowledge is the ability, or wisdom, excuse me, is the ability to apply knowledge. You can have all the knowledge you want, but you need godly wisdom. And we can pray and release the spirit of wisdom over them. So why? They can have aha type moments. An aha moment is like the eureka moment, like the light comes on. You ever heard that? Like the light just clicked. That's what we need to happen for our, our loved ones and our friends that need Jesus. We need the light to click. And so I stand in the gap for them, and I'm praying, let that light come on, Lord. Come on. Let that light come. I'm going to keep praying until that light. They have that aha moment, that revelation moment where the light clicks on, and spiritually they see things different. They begin to see their own sin, but they begin to see Jesus who paid the price for their sin on the cross. Ephesians 1 7 says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of what? Wisdom. And what? Revelation. Why? So you may know him better. That you may know him better. When you get wisdom and you get revelation, it draws you closer to him. And the closer you are to Jesus, the more you're going to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. The more you're going to walk in the newness of life. The closer you get with him, the more your life is going to change. You ain't going to recognize your old life. You're not even going to recognize how you used to be. Some of you, he's going to transform you so much, you're going to look back and say, I don't even, I don't even know that person any longer. I don't even know them. I don't even know them anymore. And then you become a testimony to what God can do. That God can save to the uttermost. A transformed and changed life. And this is what I'm praying over people. See, somebody prayed for me this way. So I got to stand in the gap and pray this for others. If he did it in me, why can't he do it in you? Why can't he do it in them? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. The last point here and I kept my word didn't I I told you I was going the last thing we pray as we stand the gap is we pray God's blessing over them when I speak of blessing I'm not just talking about that somebody buys them a lunch or that they get a raise at their job that's all great things but I'm talking about something that's even more important I'm not talking about a blessing I'm talking about the blessing 
the hand of God upon them. The hand of God on your life makes the difference. I don't want to live life without God's hand on me. I don't want to preach a word without God's hand on me. I don't want to live. I don't want to try to raise kids and, 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 and have a marriage without God's hand on my life. I don't want to try to. I don't want to do it without God. That's the blessing of God. See, we limit God's blessing to just financial and material. But God's blessing is his hand, his favor on your life, his supernatural hand working for you. 3 John 1, 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. When we stand in the gap and we pray for people, pray God's blessing on them, the blessing of God. At the end of every service, I release a blessing and I, I take it serious because I believe in the blessing of God. When my pastor texts me and, 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 he, and he speaks blessing over me, I receive it. When he's when he it's through a text, man, I don't care. It's a text. I receive the blessing from the Lord, from the man of God. I believe in the blessing of God. I think it's so important to understand that this blessing is transferable. This blessing is tra- we can we can transfer this blessing to others. I don't want it just for myself. Thank you, God, that you're prospering me in all things. And I'm in health. Thank you for all of that. Thank you that my soul's prospering. But, God, I don't want it just to be for me. What good is it just for it only to be for me and not for them as well? God, there's a world that needs saved. There's a city that needs saved. There's people that are lost. Even under the sound of my voice today, some of you barely made it here today. And it's all good. We're glad you made it. But I'm believing you're not going to stay the place that you're at. Why? Because the blessing of God is going to get on your life. Ephesians 3.16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being. I pray that. This is what the Apostle Paul, he's praying for the church at Ephesus. He's praying. That's, he's filling the gap. He's standing in the gap. He said, I'm praying this for you. Not just God will bless me, but I'm praying God bless you. I'm praying that God will bless your life, that you will be strengthened, that you will know the power of the Holy Spirit in your inner being. I pray God blesses people so much they don't want to sin no more. I pray that God is so good to people that they'll, they'll turn their back on that old life and that old way and they begin to walk in the newness of life. I pray that God blesses them so much. He gives them a merry heart. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, a merry heart does good like medicine. So many people are sick and they're, they're hooked on drugs and they're hooked on prescriptions and they're hooked on alcohol and they're hooked on lust and they're hooked on all these things. Why? Because their heart is sick. But the Bible says a merry heart heart come on a merry heart that's like medicine you don't need medicine you need the holy spirit you don't need medicine you need jesus which gives a merry heart so we're gonna pray we're gonna pray you can stand the rest of y'all can stand with the ones that are salvation why because god forgives all my sin healing why because god heals all my diseases redemption why because god rescues and restores me transform transformation why because god changes me into his likeness blessing why because god provides everything i need heads bowed this morning i'm gonna give you a chance to respond i'm gonna pray for you if you're here today and you don't know jesus Or maybe you're not walking with him. You need to get your life right. You need to turn to him today. This is what I'm going to pray. We're going to pray together this prayer. And you're going to pray it out loud. Call on the name of the Lord. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put this off. Make the decision today. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I also believe that you rose from the grave. And that you're alive right now. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I give my life to you because you gave your life for me. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Can we give God a good praise this morning?